Hello, happy Easter. I hope you are safe and well. Today's text, the reading of the gospel, is from the 28th chapter of Matthew, verses 1 through 10. And it reads, After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here for he has been raised as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came to him, took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last year, I began my Easter sermon with the reading of a poem by John Updike, written in 1960, called Seven Stanzas at Easter. And I would like to begin this year's sermon with the same poem. It reads, Make no mistake, if he rose at all, it was as his body. If the cell's disillusion did not reverse, the molecules re-knit, the amino acids rekindle, the church will fall. It was not as the flowers, each soft spring recurrent. It was not as his spirit in the mouths and fuddled eyes of the eleven apostles. It was as his flesh, ours, the same hinged thumbs and toes, the same valved heart that pierced, died, withered, paused, and then regathered out of enduring might, new strength to enclose. Let us not mock God with metaphor, analogy, sidestepping, transcendence, making of the event a parable, a sign painted in the faded credulity of earlier ages. Let us walk through the door. The stone is rolled back, not papier-mâché, not a stone in a story, but the vast rock of materiality that in the slow grinding of time will eclipse for each of us the wide light of day. And if we will have an angel at the tomb, make it a real angel, weighty with Max Planck's quanta, vivid with hair, opaque in the dawn light, robed in real linen, spun on a definite loom. Let us not seek to make it less monstrous for our own convenience, our own sense of beauty, lest, awakened in one unthinkable hour, we are embarrassed by the miracle and crushed by remonstrance. I first heard that poem in seminary in a class on atheism of all topics. And in a good seminary, you will talk about the deep mysteries of the faith. And you will leave wide room for people to question and to doubt and to work through and to sort things out. And so in our classes, it was quite common to consider stories from the Bible, like the resurrection narratives, and to approach them from different angles. Some people taking them quite literally, word for word, and others, at best, being able to find some beauty in the story by way of metaphor, or just read them and approach them as you would perhaps a parable. And so when this poem was presented to our class, our class that was drenched in skepticism, a class on atheism, it was as if the professor was asking us around Easter time to slam on the brakes and for a moment 
consider the question, what if it were absolutely true in every sense? Not only in terms of the metaphor and the beauty you find in the story, not only in terms of what the story points us towards, this reckless hope for life on the other side of every form of grave, but what if the literal sinews restitched? What if real oxygen came back into the lungs of Jesus of Nazareth? And what if this was made possible by the power of God? What if? On Easter and around this time, I choose to view this story through that lens. I confess I'm not always there. Sometimes finding it beautiful as a metaphor for life is as best as I can do. This is your pastor confessing his doubt, say around June or July, but come March and April when Easter is upon us, I choose to take on this lens and to view the story through it, not mocking God with metaphor, but to believe that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. And if that power is made available for his human body, what possibilities are there for my own? But I understand if you on this Easter Sunday find yourself deep in doubt. I have friends who at best can approach this story through skepticism. And I know many Christians who have serious doubts. And as I just said, there are a good number of days in any given year where I feel the same way. And many of those who feel that way prefer Mark's gospel. It's the earliest um, gospel that we have. And in that story, in the earliest versions of that story, without some of the addendums that would be tacked on in later centuries, you have the women coming to the tomb, finding it empty, and leaving amazed and afraid, the end, which leaves the early church to speculate, what does this mean? An empty tomb with no commentary. It leaves you room to hope for the most wildest hope, but then also to just sort of shrug and say, well, I guess I don't know what that means and I'll get about my business. But in Matthew, Luke, and John, make no mistake about it, and Matthew was the gospel that, story that we just read, uh, he is raised from the dead. He walks among the disciples. He eats food. In John's gospel, he walks through walls. One of the things about the stories about Jesus after the resurrection is that he seems to be, yes, a resurrected body, but then something more than. Which leads us to wonder, if we resurrect, are we as we are now, or are we more than? Some say that we are it. That to call us the body of Christ, the body of believers gathered around his cause, is the resurrection. And there's something to be said for it. And I don't think you have to exclude the literal resurrection from this viewpoint. I think that we can be the body of Christ in a real and meaningful sense, but also leave room to other possibilities. But most Christians throughout time have insisted that he literally rose, that his body was dead and that same body came back to life. And when it came back, the story goes, he was all that he was before and then some. Christians for millennia have concluded that if God can do this for Jesus, and if the same spirit that enlivened him now enlivens us, then we too may hope for resurrected life. Flesh and blood, body and spirit, the human brain firing on all synapses. This is a reckless hope, but it is a good hope. And it is the hope Easter calls us towards. Because on the other side of Good Friday, what else do you have? On the other side of that day where we remember that Jesus died, that God died, what else do we have? Even the slightest hope counts for something. 
And this is why I don't undercut the faith of Christians who make a metaphor of the whole thing, because even in metaphor, as is true with all great stories and poems, there is truth. Man says to me, I don't believe Jesus literally rose from the dead, but I see in Jesus's resurrection story the telling of what the disciples did after the fact and evidence that even after tragedy, there is life. And when I'm told something like this, I don't argue. Sometimes I might even say, amen. Because there have been long seasons in my life where it is the best that I could do. And if it's the best that you can do on this Easter morning, well, there is a spark there. And it is not nothing. But Christians have to believe something on Easter about Jesus and about what the resurrection means. In what sense is he alive? How is he alive is a good question. Is he alive in you and in me? Is he alive and sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven? Both scriptural ideas are not mutually exclusive, but Christians have to place their faith in some form of Easter life. Because in the everyday ebb and flow of your existence, it will call you, your beliefs about Easter will call you towards one direction or another, towards hope or towards despair. Last year, I was walking down the hall with a surgeon. I was a chaplain in a hospital at the time, and we were walking to a patient's operating table, and this patient was exactly my age, and she had, up to this point, beaten cancer, but the treatments for her cancer had rendered her neck delicate and weak, and so she kept having these bleeds from her, her major arteries in her, in her neck. And at this point, there was another rupture, and she was being rushed to the surgery room for a, a repair, a patch up, something temporary. I would learn this on the way to the surgery room because the surgeon would turn, did turn to me and candidly said, this is a terminal bleed. I don't even know why we are putting her through this. She's not gonna come back. No hope. Very reasonable and informed perspective, but no Easter. And at the same time, I marveled at a surgeon that could go in and perform a surgery with no hope for life on the other side. Even a glimmer of hope makes a difference, which makes me think that maybe he held a glimmer of hope. Maybe the weakest prayer in that circumstance does something. So I said, probably a very weak prayer. Maybe a prayer the size of a mustard seed. But in reflection on this story, it occurred to me that pastors can be the very same in preaching about Easter with the appearance of hope, but no real belief or truth behind the hope or the story we tell or a belief in the power of Easter's efficacy. And this is where John Updike's poem that I began with wakes me up. Let us not mock God with metaphor, analogy, sidestepping, transcendence, making of the event a parable, a sign painted in the faded credulity of earlier ages. Let us walk through the door. A few weeks later, at her funeral, I was asked to preach her funeral. I preached from the text in the book of Acts that tells the story of a woman named Lydia who was a wonderful woman. She was a woman beloved by her community who cared for the poor and fed the poor. And the apostle Peter rolled into town and the people were heartbroken at this terrible loss. And Peter, by the power of God, the same power that we believe animated Jesus's body after his de own death was channeled through Peter and he called Lydia back to life. And at that funeral, I preached from this text and I asked her family and friends to hope for that form of life for their beloved. That sort of extreme hope, hope that calls us to anticipate life on the ev other side of every sort of of grave. It is a hope. It is nothing we can be certain of. But faith is exactly that. Hope 
for what we cannot see. Hope in a vision so beautiful it breaks our hearts that if it were true, it would overwhelm us. Easter gives us an opportunity to believe for a day or a week or if you're very brave for the whole year that that sort of hope has been made available to you. More than an olive branch, more than a helping hand when you're falling off a cliff, but an embrace from God that will hold you beyond the grave into whatever life will find you on the other side of the grave. I invite you to walk through this door. Not to prove historically that it happened or not to argue your way to the conclusion. I've spent a lot of my life wasting my time in that regard. Not to even move the story out of metaphor if keeping it there is the only way that it speaks to you. Just walk through the door. Believing by faith, holding on to a hope that there is a power in God that can call life from every dead place. That there is a power in God that calls the universe together and may yet reclaim and reconstitute your own body after it's been pulled apart by decay. The woman, the women who arrived at the tomb did not expect it. That much is clear. They were afraid and shocked by what they saw and amazed and eventually overjoyed. But they testified to it. They testified to the life that they found where they did not expect it. Will we believe them? Will we believe their story? Will we allow their story to give us hope today? That when our loved ones die, the truest thing that we may say of them is, they have now come alive. We say every year in church, this year from our own homes, he has risen. And everyone responds, he has risen indeed. Mumble, 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 mumble. And then the pastor, hearing this lackluster response, asks everyone to respond a second time like they really mean it. And this year, I don't have the opportunity to do that with you. But I will do it by way of this video message. And I want you to say it as loud as you can, as if it were true. Use your imagination if you doubt. He is risen. And all the people respond. He is risen indeed. And if it is true, there is hope for you and for me on the other side of every form death takes. Hope on the other side of every grave.